this is the third part of the lecture on structure of solids until now we have looked at crystalline structures how crystals form and we looked at the defects that can occur in crystal structures we looked at point defects line defects surface defects and volume defects and then we started looking at amorphous structures which are materials which do not have any order in their uh, microstructure that is they are not crystalline they could be glassy or amorphous we will continue with amorphous uh, structures now. Now one interesting type of amorphous state is in metallic glasses as we know what we have discussed until now metals generally have a crystalline structure because of the metallic bond they form a crystalline symmetric structure we can have single crystal grains that can have varying sizes and these uh, grains together make up the microstructure the crystal structure is formed by nucleation growth of the crystalline phase from a molten material or molten alloy during the process of solidification however some researchers have developed multi component metal alloys which vitrify vitrify means they become amorphous with the same ease as it happens in silicate melts or silicate based glasses these bulk metallic glasses called bmgs have very unusual properties which make them interesting for engineering they are typically much stronger than the same material in crystalline form by a factor of 2 or 3 that is 2 or 3 times stronger they are also tougher that is the work to fracture is increased or rather the ability to resist cracking is increased more than in ceramics and they are also more elastic or have a higher strain limit in the elastic range. It is however not easy to make a metal into a glass the trick or the technique is to make a metallic glass by cooling the melt or the metallic liquid very fast so that the disordered structure is maintained and there is not enough time for nucleation and an orderly structure or a crystalline structure to develop and it was not until the 1960s that a true or proper metallic glass was formed it was done as an alloy of gold and silicon this was obtained by very rapid cooling in the order of 2 million degrees Celsius per second. So very fast cooling rate. More recently new alloys have been developed that become glasses at much lower cooling rates that is not so fast only in the range of 1 to 100 degrees per second. Though this is still very rapid it is slow enough to make pieces or bulk ingots this is this is a piece of one metallic glass here we see the difference in structure between crystalline zirconium and amorphous zirconium on the left you will see a more ordered structure in the zirconium this is now a zirconium glass or an amorphous zirconium on the right you see a metal glass which is an alloy now of zirconium titanium copper nickel and aluminum one thing that is common in the newly developed metal glass is that we have many different types of atoms together in the alloy this makes the nucleation get delayed because to have an orderly structure with different types and sizes of atoms requires a slower cooling so when you cool the material fast enough an alloy with many different types of atoms together has a higher chance of forming a metallic glass metallic glasses having magnetic properties have also been developed they are typically iron rich amorphous solids with compositions such as iron boron and iron boron silicon and these are 
formed into long metallic glass ribbons by a technique called melt spinning, where a jet a stream of molten glass is propelled it is shot against a moving surface say a cold rotating copper cylinder. So, when this jet hits the cold cylinder it cools down immediately and you see that here in this diagram. So, you have this uh, copper wheel that is spinning this is kept very cold and then you have the jet of metal shot impinging against this copper wheel. So, this is spinning at a fast rate and when this hits it cools down and forms this metal glass ribbon. So, here in this case the solid film of metal glass is spun off as a continuous ribbon. So, this is the ribbon which is coming at a speed that can exceed a kilometer per minute because of the fast spinning of this copper wheel. Metallic glasses can be very strong as I said initially, yet they can be highly elastic. Generally we find that strong materials are more brittle and have low elongation, but metallic glasses are interesting because they can be strong and elastic and tough that means they can resist fracture and cracking well. Also more interesting are the thermal properties. For example, just like an oxide glass in the metal glasses also there is a glass transition temperature. This is the temperature above which a metallic glass becomes soft like what we see in other amorphous materials polymers and so on. So, above the glass transition temperature T g the metal glass becomes soft and flows easily we can take this uh, material to temperatures higher than the glass transition temperature and mold it into different shapes. So, there are lot of opportunities for making metallic glasses into complex shapes. Here you see how the metallic glasses or glassy alloys are placed in the space of strength and elastic limit on the x axis you have the elastic limit at failure on the y axis you have strength. And you see that polymers can be very elastic that means they have a very high elongation, but the strength is not very high. Metals on the other hand can have high strength, but their elastic limit is limited. On the other hand we have these metallic glasses which now have both high strength and high elongation which makes it very interesting in terms of properties that we need in civil engineering. Obviously, there are other materials which are in the other end of the spectrum like glass and brittle materials which have neither a high elastic limit nor very high strength. One type is called liquid metal it is a patented uh, product with a mixture of zirconium, beryllium, titanium, copper and nickel. And here just to give you an idea we have put the different relative sizes of the atoms of this mixture and you see that the sizes of the atoms are quite different. So, for nucleation to occur and orderly structure to occur with all these different types of sizes of atoms there is a slow cooling that is required to get a crystalline structure. So, when the cooling is fast this type of material can form a metallic glass relatively easily. So, as I said because of the varying sizes of these atoms the atom sizes we saw are very very different and the random arrangement in the solid it is very difficult for groups of atoms to move past one another. And because of this we have what is called atomic gridlock and this imparts a lot of hardness in the amorphous material. Slipping or sliding of the atoms against each other along planes is very difficult. This is something that we discussed already when we looked at alloys or point defects. 
Another kind of amorphous material is that which is caused by precipitation of solids. Precipitation leads often to a disorderly structure and amorphous precipitates generally are a collection of individual particles which can be strongly stuck together, but still they do not have a orderly or a crystalline structure. The precipitate then forms a solid matrix with packed particles. These structures are generally severely defected that is they do not have a very dense packing. They have high concentrations of planar and volumetric defects, defects such as grain boundaries and pores can occur very easily in such precipitates. Because of the defected nature these precipitates have high surface areas and because of this there is a lot of van der Waals interaction between the adjacent particles which gives rise to gelling. A gel you would remember is a material which has liquid between solid particles and this is called a gel and because these materials have a lot of surface and volumetric defects you can have a lot of gels being formed due to precipitates. One important gel in the area of civil engineering materials is the calcium silicate hydrate which is formed as an amorphous precipitate due to the reaction of Portland cement and water and this is the glue that binds the hydrated cement paste and therefore concrete together. And the pictures at the bottom are taken from Taylor and Mehta and Montero where you see the gel structure of the calcium silicate hydrate you see the spongy structure here with lot of particles put together lot of clumps of calcium silicate hydrate gel and within these layers you have a lot of water called the gel water and there is a lot of porosity outside also. Though this structure is very defected and porous it gives the strength required to make concrete a very useful material. This is a very interesting picture from soft x-ray microscopy from uh, Berkeley from uh, Paolo Monteiro's group where you see the initial hydrates forming when you have a cement grain in water. So, these are cement grains the dark yellow ones are the cement grains and this is in water and you see the gel forming this light brown structure that you find is the amorphous precipitates forming as the cement now reacts with water. Now, we go on to a different type of material the polymer. Polymers are large molecules chain molecules which are made out of several repeating units called monomers. So, each of this is a monomer and together when they join together we call them a polymer. The monomers react chemically with each other we saw before that there is covalent bonds which develop between the particles and form these molecular chains which can have several hundred to several thousand monomer units. So, it is a repeating unit of this type which keeps reoccurring through the polymer chain. So, this is very different from the structures that we have discussed before. Most of the monomers involved are organic compounds and the typical polymer is therefore, characterized by a carbon chain backbone that backbone is the central structure of the polymer which is made up of carbon atoms. What we see here in this diagram is how polyethylene looks. So, these are the hydrogen atoms this is carbon and we have hydrogen on the other side. So, this forms a chain and you remember when we discussed about covalent bonds that long strong chains can form due to covalent bonding and the other thing is that the covalent bond was directional. So, there is a certain directionality in how these monomers are bonded together and this gives rise to a very interesting characteristic of polymers. One of the important aspects of the carbon backbone 
is that there is a tetrahedral bonding configuration. There is a tetrahedral bonding configuration okay, that you see here. And this allows for free rotation of one segment of the carbon backbone relative to another. So, if you see this diagram, you find that the rightmost atom, this atom can be anywhere on this dash circle for this angle to be maintained. So, if this is rotated on this circle while maintaining the 109 degree angle, you find that there is a lot of movement or strain obtained without breaking any bond. So, this leads to either chains like this which can be relatively straight maintaining this angle or the same chain can be twisted into this and in this process we are not breaking any bond. So, there is a lot of flexibility that is obtained because of this type of formation of the polymer chains. Consequently, the single chains of polymers which are very long are capable of very large rotation and bending in three dimensions. They can undergo a lot of displacement, lot of strains without breaking. Also these long chains now get entangled. They get caught among themselves and this entanglement prevents crystallization of the polymer, reduces the possibility of all these chains getting aligned in an orderly manner because they get entangled very easily. You can see in this picture how the there is a polymer chain which is entangled by itself and you can imagine how difficult it will be for all these chains to be aligned in a orderly structure. And this also gives rise to very high viscosity because as these chains get entangled it is very difficult for the liquid to move easily. These chains get entangled among themselves and with neighboring chains so that the material does not flow very easily. So, two of the very important consequences of the covalent bond within the polymer state is that it gives rise to lot of ability for the chains to rotate and bend and this prevents crystallization, the level of crystallization in polymers is reduced, they become more amorphous and very importantly they become highly viscous as the polymer chains are formed and are made to flow. And this is a uh, image taken from scanning probe microscopy from Callister where you can see the chains entangled these are different chains of polyethylene which are here even though the chains are very large you see some sort of an orderly structure and this is how each of the chains this is this chain here is shown here. There are different types of molecular structures which occur. The simplest structure is a linear polymer where you have long flexible chains with extensive van der Waals bonds between the chains. If you remember we said that within a polymer chain you have covalent bonds, but these chains bond with each other with a weak van der Waals bonds. So, this happens in many polymers that we come across such as polythene or polyethylene, PVC or polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene polymethyl methacrylate and nylon. So, these are linear polymers. You can have polymers with side chains also. These are called branched polymers where we have these branches occurring from the main chain. So, there are side reactions which cause these branches during polymerization and you can imagine that it will be now more difficult for such structures to be ordered and become crystalline. So, that is why we see higher degree of crystallinity orderliness 
in linear polymers than other type of polymers like branch polymers. In branch polymers, it will now become more difficult for an orderly structure to form because of these branches which will get in the way of the polymers being aligned and packed. We also have cross linked polymers where we have covalent bonds between different chains. Instead of the covalent bonds only occurring along the chain, now we have covalent bonds which are linking different chains together. So, adjacent linear chains are joined through covalent bonds and this is called cross linking which is achieved by additive atoms or molecules that covalently bond with the chains. And one example of this is rubbery elastic materials which have a lot of elasticity and can undergo a lot of strains. We have network polymers, polymers that link up together to form a three dimensional network and here because of the covalent bonds you can have a very strong material. So, here we have trifunctional mer units with three active covalent bonds. So, you see that each has three active bonds and you get a three dimensional network such as in an epoxy. And all of us have used plastics which are hard and strong in many applications such as in epoxies. Two major classes of polymers can be made depending on how they function under high temperatures. First is called the thermoplasts. Thermoplasts polymers are homopolymers where we have the same type of monomers in this in the chain. They could be a mix called a copolymer. This is called a statistical copolymer where we have a random mix of two polymers or we have a block polymer where some part of the chain is of one polymer, another part of the chain is of another polymer. So, whenever we have different monomers used in the synthesis of a polymer, it is called a copolymer and both of these can be thermoplast. Thermoplast means that the polymer will melt under high temperature and when you cool the material, it will go back to a solid state. So, that is what is called a thermoplast. These thermoplast polymers can occur in the amorphous state here, disordered, entangled chains or it could be crystalline to some extent. That, say this part, this part is orderly. There are the chains which are closely packed together. Hmm. So, you see here that this is a crystalline part. The rest could be amorphous. So, that is why it is called semi crystalline that is partly crystalline. So, we find that the crystalline state may exist in polymer materials and as far as polymers are concerned, we say a polymer is crystalline when there is an orderly packing and you have an array of the chains. So, in the same polymer you can have an amorphous region and you can also have a crystalline region. And the proportions between these two will tell us what is the degree of crystallinity of the polymer. Thermoplasts also have a viscous behavior when they are polymerizing. Initially, when you have just the monomers, you have a lot of flow possible in the material, the viscosity is low the monomers do not entangle, they are all separate and the material can flow easily. As the monomers now start to link up and form chains, as the chains become longer, there is more and more stickiness or entanglement and you find now that the liquid material does not flow that easily or the viscosity is now higher. Now, this increases as the polymer chains become longer and longer they reach a state where they become totally entangled and even though the individual chains are flexible, the whole mass does not move because the chains get entangled and you can reach a state that it will not even come out of a vessel that you are putting. Here the viscosity is very high. 
here the viscosity becomes very very high. The other class of polymers are called thermosets. Thermosets are those which will not melt, but will only decompose at very high temperatures and these are generally cross link polymers. They are not the chain polymers that we looked at in the case of thermoplasts and here what happens is the thermoset polymer is generally plastic in the primary stage initially it is, but once molded or set once the cross links have been formed they cannot be re softened you cannot make it in them into liquids again by reheating like we could in the case of a thermoplast. So, once they are set they stay that way and they cannot be reheated to soften and to be remolded and this is because of the covalent bonds between the chains. In the case of thermoplast we had only van der Waals bonds between the chains. So, these van der Waals bonds could be broken easily the chains could move around and then when the temperature is brought down again the van der Waals bonds are strong enough to keep them in place. Here between the chains we have covalent bonds which are not so easy to break and when they are broken they do not form again. So, this is a comparison of what I have explained. In thermoplast we have these chains usually linear polymers and between the chains we have van der Waals bonds between the chains we have van der Waals bonds and with heat these van der Waals bonds are broken and the chains can move around easily. So, this is what happens in melting this is what happens when the thermoplast is melted the chains are separated and when they are cooled again the van der Waals bonds will keep them together. However, when we look at a thermoset you have the chains bonded to each other by covalent bonds and when heat is applied these covalent bonds do not break and join again when they cool, but we have the chains disintegrating. We have degradation of the chains, so the chains break up and when we cool back they do not join again or they do not go back to the same way. In the thermoplast we can go back when we cool, but so when we cool we go back here, but in this case we can do not go back that is why it is called a thermoset. So, with this we have looked at different types of materials different states of materials we have in the last lecture last part of this lecture we have looked at how uh, polymers are formed we looked previously at how uh, amorphous materials occur and before that we looked at crystalline materials. Um, these are the different references some of these concepts could be um, difficult to assimilate you should go through these references there are uh, several of these which will give a good background on how the material structures are formed and what is very important for us to understand as civil engineers is how the bonds lead to certain type of structures and how these structures go on to influence the behavior of different materials. And this is also interesting when you look at a new material that you have not been taught how it behaves or you have not come across before knowing what is the type of material what is the family the chemical family that it comes from you can understand how it will behave. Because there are a lot of materials which are being produced uh, on a daily basis new materials that are being introduced and to understand these materials or at least to predict what could happen in these materials it is good to know what is the structure of the material how the structure has been formed and we have given you some basics in this lecture on structure of solids. Now, in the lectures that follow now we will go on to see how movement occurs in these solids and other properties linked to the structure and later on we will build up on this to take you on to look at different materials that we use in civil engineering. Thank you. We will take some questions on structure of solids from some of our students here. Yeah, Sujata. Uh, sir, which type of uh, polymer can uh, elongate more linear or cross link polymer? 
generally the linear uh, polymers do not have covalent uh, bonds between the chains. Since we have only Van der Waals bonds, then they can elongate much more. And you also know that when we have network polymers with lot of covalent bonds like in epoxies, they are very brittle even though they are very strong and hard. Sir, we know that the ionic bond is the strongest. Uh, what about uh, diamond crystals which we have? The, those are based on covalent bonds, but we still have the strongest material as diamond. Yeah. See, covalent bonds are also strong along the direction of the bonds. And in the case of uh, uh, silica and diamond, we have a network which is formed entirely by covalent bonds. And because of that, you have a strong material. Generally covalent bonded materials are not very strong because we have the sheets and the chains which are linked only by Van der Waals bonds. But here in the case of diamond, we have a network structure that is entirely linked with covalent bonds. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to also tell you one interesting anecdote. I had a, a student come to me after one of these lectures and uh, if you remember in this uh, lecture that I talked about metallic glasses and the student brought me this uh, mirror from a place called Aranmula in uh, Kerala. So, if you are not familiar with uh, India, Kerala is uh, one of our southern states and here we have something that is very typical of a certain town called Aranmula in uh, Kerala where they make these mirrors and what you see in the middle is uh, not glass, it is not a glass mirror but it is a metal mirror and uh, this is made out of an alloy of copper with very high tin content and it is very uh, well polished to become this mirror type surface. What I have understood that it is also a very brittle material and uh, it retains its uh, shiny surface, but if you drop it, it can break very easily. And uh, we have one of our students who is from this place Aranmula and maybe Sunita can tell us a little bit about the village and anything else you know about this mirror. Uh, Aranmula is a village in Patanantita district. Patanantita is uh, where Shabrimala is also situated. So, the main uh, industry of this uh, mirror manufacturing is around the Parthasarathi temple where you have Krishna and Arjuna. That is the only temple in India which has Arjuna's uh, idol. And uh, this mirror has uh, uh, importance that uh, in Kerala marriage ceremonies we have something called Ashtamangalyam where uh, when the marriage, marriage take place there are eight uh, aus auspicious things that are kept on a uh, on a plate and which is used to receive the bride and the bridegroom. So, this mirror belongs to one of the Ashtamangalya things. So, it is considered to be very ausp auspicious and also it brings in luck if you have it at home. So, that is the myth behind uh, the mirror. I, I do not know much about the uh, manufacturing because it is very kept very secretive. It is belonging to only one family and uh, they have been passing on through generations this uh, secret. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, what we do know is that it is an alloy of uh, copper with very high tin content and as Sunita said not much is known about the exact proportions and it is kept as a family secret. But also what we know is that it is, uh, it can be polished, it can be uh, made into a very reflective surface like what you see here, but it is also a very brittle material because we have introduced in this material so much of tin that it is basically becomes unstable in terms of the lattice because you have put a lot of uh, more tin than it is stable for the lattice structure of copper and that is why it becomes very brittle and it is not able to create the shearing or the slip planes within the material. So, if it, if it is dropped, it breaks very easily, which is not typical of a metal. So, uh, going back to the uh, question that the student asked me, this is not a metallic glass, but it is a reflective surface, particularly in this case, it is a copper tin alloy. Thank you very much. We will see you in the next lecture. Yeah.